gates and all of that. It was a meeting. Yes, yes. I think Advocate Bawa is quite correct. I don't remember at any point in time sitting with the, with the ministers. What I do remember is that I had submitted representation myself. made some representations to, 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 to the Minister of Justice. I did make representations to him. And who was the minister? He must have been Minister Jeff Khadebe or Minister Serdi. They were, they were minister. Is it Minister Jeff Khadebe? Yes, it says it was Minister Jeff Khadebe. You made these representations orally in a meeting in, or in writing? No, no. In, they were in writing. In writing. They were in Thank writing, Jeff. Thank you for, clear, for the clarity. Ne? Thanks, Uche. You don't remember who the police minister was at the time? You don't know? OK. I All think right. it's Becky Chile, but I, I don't well, want to put my head on No, he was commissioner, probably, not minister yet. OK. Thank you. Now, it's, it's quite a lengthy affidavit, and you did it quite a, a while ago, so I'm not going to take you paragraph by paragraph through the affidavit. But in essence, in, in the evidence before this inquiry, there are some things which is different to what he said in the affidavit, and I, and I want to run that past you. The affidavit is drafted on the presupposition, and and I can take you to the paragraphs, but let's just deal with the principles, and if we need to, it's it's drafted on the presupposition that when Karen van Rensburg, advocates Umzenyati, advocate Ramaiti, and I think there's one other person meets with Glennis Breitenbach on the 25th of November, that they actually tell her what the complaint is about and who the complaint is from. Right? Yes, Chepis. And the evidence from both Van Rensburg who confirmed, no, I didn't tell her, and Glennis Breitenbach who says, no, I didn't know, I in fact thought it came from the police. You, you would agree that was the evidence we got. Do you have any comment on that? That was the evidence we got from who? From Advocate Breitenbach? Advocate Breitenbach. That is what she said, yes. Yes. She said yes. yes. But Advocate Van Rensburg, who's in the meeting on the 25th, says, I didn't tell her who the complaint, we didn't tell her who the complaint was from, and we didn't give her the details of the complaint. I do not remember here whether she said that they didn't inform her of the complaint or that they did inform her of the complaint. I I'll get my junior to find the exact I'm, reference I'm so in the sure, transcript. Yes. Okay. So the proposition I'm putting to you is that as at 25th November, Advocate Breitenbach didn't have the details of the complaint. I am not able to answer that, uh, Advocate Bauer, really, as to whether I, I only depend on what I am saying here in my affidavit, and what I'm saying in my affidavit would have been based on what I was told. That's what I'm coming to. Yes. So the contents of your affidavit, which you file in the Labour Court, is premised on information which is relayed to you. Yes. Correct? Yes. In relation to stuff which you are not party to, for example, whether or not she knew about the complaint on the 25th, you don't have personal knowledge on which to say she did. No, I wouldn't be because I was not part of those discussions. But there are some aspects in relation to which you do have personal knowledge of, for example, whilst Advocate Van Rensburg's evidence in relation to whilst the memorandum was signed by you early March, it was only subsequently with the letter was signed in April because of a dispute in respect of who was meant to sign that letter. Do you agree with that or do you disagree with that? That was a that was part of the part of the reason that one was not so sure whether he had authority to do so or the minister had authority to do so. 
to sign the letter of suspension. What was the other reason why the letter wasn't signed? Well, there was this issue about the laptop and 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 and, and all of that. Yes. But Advocate Jiba, again, you don't have personal knowledge of what transpired on the laptop. That would have been what have been relayed to you by whoever provided you with a version of what happened on the laptop. And the reason why I raise that is because the person who seemed to have been the hands-on person who dealt with the laptop was Mr. Wasserman, correct? It could have been Mr. Wasserman, but I just know that there was a team that was, invest that was appointed to, I don't know whether it was Mr. Wasserman, but there was a team appointed to investigate, yes. No, but the, the, the team that was appointed to the investigators, but um, when one looks at the disciplinary committee judgment, you, you, you might not have seen it recently, but you would have looked at it then at the time, correct? You would have looked at the disciplinary tribunal's judgment when they handed it down in the Breitenbach disciplinary inquiry. Yes. Right. And, and, and they in the detail what Wasserman's evidence was in respect of the laptop, which yeah. I doubt yes. that. And yes, the to and froing about the agreement as to whether there's a protection of privacy, the, the whole question of what the NPA's internet policy actually says about privacy documents. I raised that with, I've forgotten who, but one of the witnesses. He must have raised it with, with, with uh, Ms. Van Rensburg. I, I, so. I probably did. Yeah. Yes. I know I had the internet policy at the time, which I can't find now, and I don't really want to... You, you were not involved in the actual details. No. But you were... In I, I was not actually involved in the details. I was just briefed on what is actually happening. You're quite correct. Right. So, but when it came to actually making the decision to suspend her, that was your decision? Based on the recommendation, yes, it was my decision. Right. But that recommendation was made to you in January? In February. In, in, uh, Advocate Mkhwebi's um, memorandum comes to you on the 12th of January with a recommendation contained in. The recommendation is, I think I put to him, fourfold disciplinary proceedings, criminal proceedings, suspension and something else. Um, yes, but at the time, I don't recall if there were investigations to okay. that that have, that were that were materially um, conducted, which is why, if my memory serves me correct, I would have referred it to to corporate services to deal with. Okay. In fact, my junior points out to me that Advocate Van Rensburg's evidence was. It is normal process in disciplinary proceedings not to give people the details of the complaints against them. Do you ring a bell? That was her evidence. That, that the, was her evidence. She, yes. she, she knows it more than I do. Yeah. So, yes. Um, so, sorry, now I've lost my train of thought. We you were, were asking me, what are you asking me about? I can't remember anymore. I think I must take Mr. Majavu's advice and just stop. Um, <laughs> Um, decision was made on uh, the recommendations by uh, okay. Mr. Mkwebi in January. Sorry. So, so there was an investigation that ensued. You then signed the memorandum, effectively making a decision that she was going to be suspended, correct? On the... 2nd of March. The memorandum that came from labor relations, you yes. mean that one? Yes. I'm not so sure what is the date. Yes. Right. So I, I, I know you're not so sure, but would you accept if Mr. Nematengahani says it was the 2nd of March, then he's probably got it right. She probably got it right because I don't have the document. Yes. Me. Yes. Right. Um, okay. Now, there is one comment that you make in your affidavit that I wanted some clarity on, and it's paragraph 73.4. You, 
you referring to the maybe if we take it back the allegation which advocate Breitenbach makes um, is that you suspended a for an ulterior motive in order to shield General Mluli and in previous page in paragraph 73 you deny those allegations and in fact you regard them to be objectionable and defamatory paragraph 73.1 and just want to put the context into what I'm asking you right and then in paragraph um, 73.4 you 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 point out that you, you you're talking about her memorandum of the April memorandum which she had delivered to you and which um, which you say you didn't regard it as misconduct and you didn't regard it as being um, an ultimatum in the peace cursing paragraph and then you f say you found nothing offensive or objectionable in the contents because you accept that people have different views on approaches from time to time. Do you see that at the bottom? Yes, Chair. And then you point out that the applicant needs to appreciate that at the end of the day the NPAC confers certain powers upon decision makers to make a decision even if such decision may not find favour with some employees with the NPA. Yes, yes. I see right. that. Were you aware at that stage that Advocate Mkhwebi did not consult with Advocate Mzanyati as what was required by the NPA Act? Or let me ask it better. Yes, when did you become aware of that? When, when I was getting a briefing. Now I'm not, I think when I was getting a briefing or probably in the meeting that we had in January, somewhere around that. In January of 2012? Could have been in January of or when, when the issue was then discussed in, the, in, the, in that particular famous meeting. The ex-co meeting, that's, the one that, that people mm, call... Uh, everybody refers to, yes. The January 24th, 25th meeting. The January 24th and 25th meeting, yes. So didn't it struck you, even before the full application landed, that that point is disastrous for when the full application landed. Because, because that goes to prospects of success as to whether his decision can withstand a legal challenge. I'll be honest with you, Advocate Bauer. It didn't for the reason that, um, for the reason of the fact that, you know, we've never really, as an institution, focused on that particular, on the application of that particular provision. Because you will recall that the SCCU was established long time ago. And as we have had, uh, I think it was uh, Advocate too. Yes, it was Advocate Chris Jordan. So it really didn't strike me uh, uh, that much uh, uh, that the the application that is brought by full or brought by anybody else would really hinge in 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 that in that in that in that prospect yeah but you get the breitenbach memo that takes the point squarely you know that mzanyati is unhappy mm -mm. Um, i don't know that mzanyati is unhappy mzanyati, because the mzanyati, mzanyati has not said he is unhappy. You must recall that Mzinyati is a DPP. I have a very close relationship with Mzinyati, as you have heard when she was testifying, testifying here. He has never indicated any unhappiness. And if I recall uh, from what he said wa wa was that in, in the process, he then got convinced by what Advocate Mkhwebi was saying. So hence he agreed with the, with the decision to have the matter provisionally withdrawn. So I moved from the premise that the matter is now provisionally withdrawn. So therefore, the investigations shall continue. 
So I was referring to the precursor to the 9th of December meeting where he is unhappy at the fact that Mkwebi, Advocate Mkwebi, actually takes the decision and writes to the, to the lawyers um, for Mr. Mluli. Um, that is what I was referring to in terms of unhappiness. And the, the details are provided. Are you saying that you are not aware of those details until you are not, you were not aware of those details? of the unhappiness. You, you, spoke, you speak about the unhappiness of Advocate Mzinyat. Maybe let me not use the phrase and unhappiness. Neither, and neither did uh, Advocate. You recall that the memo is, 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 is uh, council indicated. The memo is directed to everybody, including Advocate Mzinyat. Neither does Advocate Mzinyat say use the opportunity that there is now this memorandum, which is also addressed to him come to register this particular unhappiness that you are talking about. If I take you to 102.1 of the affidavit on page 643. I just want to be clear. You, you don't dispute that the decision was taken by Advocate Mkwebi at the time and that you knew it was taken by Advocate Mkwebi? No, I do not dispute that okay. the decision was taken by Advocate Mkwebi after all of that, yeah. what he regarded as consultation. That, that I do not dispute. Yes. Now, what, what then transpires after all said and done, you did not regard the Breitenbach memo as a as a request for you to actually review Advocate Mkwebi's decision? When you read uh, section 22, I think it's section 221C of the NPA 8, but I'll have to look into whether I'm quoting the right provision. <laughs> You're talking about? Yes. Um, if you can just assist me in whether it's 22 one c or... But on a reading of that particular section, it, it, it gives the national director or the incumbent there of a discretion as to who becomes a relevant person. And I don't want to be understood to be saying that a prosecutor may never be a relevant person. The reason why I said it did not come from a relevant person in the sense that, to my understanding, she, regardless of the effect on how they ended up coming to this agreement now together, she, she is the person who, I am told, is given all the rights and the powers and every, everything to do to ensure that the case is then enrolled and, and, and uh, the investigation is actually completed. That is my understanding, and that is why I made that uh, in that decision. Yes. And and didn't it cross your mind that if that was the case, why is this memorandum landing by me? Many things cross my mind. Did that one cross your mind? Which one? I just asked you. Did did you not question? If, if Advocate Breitenbach was responsible for ensuring that this matter continues, why is she bringing this memorandum to me? That's exactly the issue that I had. 
And um, I don't want to cast aspersions on, on anybody else. We've heard the testimony of Advocate Brayden Barge. He She never regarded Advocate Mkwebi as a person who's competent. That That's her testimony before this inquiry. So I'm saying to you, many things crossed my mind because uh, I think this was this was an unprecedented uh, occurrence in the NPA where you have one of your junior officials. And I didn't understand Advocate Mkwebo to be saying that this case on the basis of the withdrawal which has happened, this case is not going to proceed. I didn't understand him to be saying that. So it was unprecedented indeed. It, it is unprecedented because on their own evidence, they don't think something like that had been done in the MPA before, where official takes a more senior person on the review to the NDPP who seeks to do so. I think that was Advocate Ferreira's evidence that they actually consulted amongst themselves or to that effect. But it seems, and, and my question is, you're not answering my directly, and maybe I should ask you directly. Was the wasn't there cause for you to actually have a conversation with the prosecutors about what, what, why are they so unhappy? Or let not use the phrase unhappy. Why are they bringing this memorandum when you've been led to understand that the ball is in their court to actually proceed and get this prosecution on the road? I did not consider it necessary to do so, uh, Chairperson. And why did you not consider it necessary to do so? Because I have no doubt into what was being said to me by the, by the, by the, by the special director himself. And over and above that, I have Advocate Mzinyati here, who is actually a DPP. He has not raised any issues about, about, about this agreement that they supposedly had on that particular date. But you know from the memorandum that Advocate Mzinyati is also of the view that there is a prima facie case and that essentially they reached this agreement because Advocate Mkwebi had written the letter off to Mr. Mluli's attorneys before they could even have a meeting. But so so that in itself is an indication that 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 all was not right amongst those involved. Sorry, I interrupted you. <laughs> Might have been an indication that all is not right. But remember, this is not just a conversation. It is, it is being briefed on what the challenges on the case are. And the memorandum doesn't say we have now addressed the, the challenges that are particularly involved in the case. Did you consider the merits? Were you briefed as to the merits of the case? Or, uh, in other words, did you agree with Advocate Mkhwebi's view that there should be overtures made to the Inspector General and the Auditor General? No, I did not agree as to how they should then go about getting the, 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 the nature of the evidence that he was actually looking for. In fact, uh, you remind me of something now, uh, Advocate Bauer, yes, remind me of something. Uh, this, was at a, yeah, this, was, this was at a time when there was also, I think General Pierre Haman was the National Commissioner here at this time. I think she was a National Commissioner at this time. In the midst of everything, I, I, I did speak to General Pierre to say that, you know, there is a particular problem which relates to the documents and whatnot in the environment of crime intelligence. But the explanation that she gave was too long for my understanding. So the reason why I ask you that because come March, there is a letter which comes to you from General Dramat, which accompanies the letter from uh, uh, General Makanazi um, 
Makonazi. Which one is that? Can you the show March us? the 19th letter. Is, is it the one that was uh, in general? Not general. Is it, is it the one that was um, shown by, by Mr. Rulofse? I'm so, not sure. So there's a couple of dramatic letters. Yeah, maybe um, take me through the dramatic letters. I can this, was, remember. this was the first one which comes um, on the 23rd of March. Now there's a Ferrara file that's been given to you. We called it that. A bundle of documents which your laptop may be on top of. You have to find the pages. This one. And if you look at the bottom right hand corner at 111, bottom right hand corner, page 111. It's a letter dated from uh, General Dramat, 23rd of March 2012, and attached to it is a 19th March letter. Not on this file. Sorry, Chair. The 119 bottom right corner. That 111. So this is the letter that is sent by General Dramat, the first letter that I'm aware of, and attached to that is a letter from the Inspector General of Intelligence. I see the letter, Shepherdson. This is a response pursuant to what they understand to be the request from Advocate Mkwebi. Go to the Inspector General and get them to help us to do this. Do you have any comment? Um, I remember receiving not this particular letter. I remember receiving the one that uh, we ended up having a meeting about with General Tramat. So you don't have a recollection receiving this letter? No, I don't have a recollection right. receiving this one. If you go further on in the file while we are, and let's just deal with the Tramat letters at the same time, there is another letter dated 23rd April 2012 which is on page 11. It's just before the Breitenbach Memorandum. Just before the maybe, maybe it's, maybe After. it's not. It let, me, let me just give it to you. It's the one date, the 23rd of April, 2012, and it refers back to the letter of the 23rd of March. Seems like he was writing to you monthly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 23rd of April. It, it, it is actually, sorry, G, it is actually part of the documents which uh, Colonel Rulofsa gave us, and I had just shifted mine forward, but it formed part of the annexure, so it could be at the back of that. Um. It's not this bundle. It's not the Ferreira ones. It's, it's at the back of that bundle. Um, I think it's the. But Advocate Jiba, you've got that letter. That is the letter which Advocate, which General Dramat testified to. He got a response from Mr. Pinka. Do you recall that he got a? Uh, a response saying that this matter is being dealt with by uh, Advocate Mkwebi. I 
rec I recall that chair. Yes. I recall her. I recall that it, response. And and do you not recall receiving that letter? Not really. Let me explain how I functioned in the office. What happened in the office um, when I assumed this role as an acting national director, I found a personnel in the office of the actual NDPP. And the way in which they were functioning in the office of the NDPP was that if there's correspondence, if there's correspondence that you know that it is a matter that is dealt with by asset forfeiture unit, for example, that matter will be directed to asset forfeiture unit. And if it's correspondence that you know it's a matter that is dealt with by whatever unit, then you direct that matter to that a particular case, that particular, that particular unit. So my suspicion here is that it's a suspicion. I had no reason not to respond to General Dramat. My suspicion here is that Ms. Lipinga could have just read that uh, Advocate Mkhwebi, this and that and that, and then wrote that response. As you can see, that response is not signed off by me. It's not, it's, it's, it's not signed off by me, actually. It is signed off by him, which is why I recall that when we were in one of the JCPS cluster meetings uh, with General Dramat, uh, after we have now resolved the issues, I said to him, but why didn't you just phone me or whatever and, 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 and do something so that we can easily solve the impasse? Because I'm sitting on the other end thinking that things are happening and we are unhappy on the other hand because then there was something that the investigation is closed, uh, my decision, and all of those things that were actually making him unhappy. But you do see from the letter which you subsequently get, which is page 146 of the bundle, that he in fact refers back to his previous two letters. Yes. Yeah. 110 what? That, that is the letter of the 8th of June. If you see there at the bottom, somebody signed for this letter. I, I can't read this. It's, it's a mudaum, mudaum, something. Somebody must have signed for it. I don't the know who 23rd signed. The 23rd letter. That is the, the 23rd of April letter. Yeah, yes. I, I, that is the copy I got. we got from Colonel Rulof, so we actually didn't find a copy at the NPA office. So I don't know what the signature means or who it was. Yeah. Um, yes. Yes, I, I, I agree with you, Chairperson. I don't make an issue about that. You get this letter of the 8th of June. Yes. Right? Yes. And it seems as if Dramat wants some sort of an explanation as to what is going on. He's now sent off two letters. Um, and he hasn't received uh, any joy, and he then makes an urgent appeal to you in the second last paragraph to urgently review the decision of Advocate Mkhwebi and your capacity as the acting NDPP. Right. Yes, sir. And what is the question? Do you, you, you then take advice on this letter. Advocates Motamela them are on brief already, isn't it? You have a meeting with Advocate Motamela them about this? All I know is that at this time, we were already engaged now in the, in the litigation with uh, freedom under the law. And, uh, and it, that, that could have been the reason why perhaps we did not meet after she wrote that, because at that time now, we're already engaged with the, with the litigation with freedom under the law. Yes. I do not know whether I raised it with Advocate Motimele or I didn't raise it with Advocate Motimele, but that's what happened. So you don't recall, um, you, you could very well have met with Advocate Motomeli about it. That's why I'm saying, uh, Chair, I, I, I do not recall whether I had discussed it with, her, with, he, with them or whether I had not discussed it with them. I wouldn't recall. You were, you were, 
we, we had jumped from where we were to Tramat. Let me go back. Or else I'm going to... Uh, we were dealing with your affidavit in the full matter before we got sidetracked. Affidavit in the in the labour court matter, right? Um, uh, sorry. Actually, no. I was coming to the full matter. I told you it finished with it. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Right now, you you finalise that affidavit in the full matter. We, we pass the Labour Court now. Okay. okay. We, you you finalised your affidavit in the full matter, being aware that it was essentially being drafted by Advocate Bohatla and Mr. Ch Chita. Did you know that? We, which one? Because there have been so many drafts. You, you, you're referring to which one? The one that was uh, there was now Advocate Motemele, which one? Right, so let me jump. We have Advocate Motemele. Let's do this maybe chronologically. We have Advocate Motemele who's initially briefed. You party to that briefing and you go and you have a consultation with him together with, um, I think, Mr. Cheetah, the state attorney and advocate Mohatla's evidence was that she was with at the first meeting. Do you recall that? Uh, yes, it might have been. In the, in that the is the meeting at where they take the view that this is all premature and the letter must be sent off to full um, to, to deal with it. Uh, I, know, uh, I know, can I make this easy for you? You have dealt with this in several affidavits. Can, I, can we, for purposes of evidence, accept that what you say about it is what is contained in your affidavits? Correct. Rather, I'm not trying to catch you by yes. trying to get you to say something different orally. Yes. And I want to be very clear about that. So what I do want to take you to is Advocate Halgrain is very clear, and you've seen the m memo that he provided to the inquiry, that he gave you very specific advice about the prospects of success of the application. And he disagrees with you as to what you say informed his advice. And I'd like to have your comment on that. The, the difficulty I had with the advice of a advocate um, Halkhrain is precisely because at the time time has a time has has, has gone by ne? at the time he's giving me this advice there's already a new prosecution team in the matter Jefferson and the new prosecution team sees the case the other way around. I remember when I had a meeting with them because I was coming from Advocate Halkhrain fully with full force myself. So I remember when I had the meeting with them, there's this prosecutor, Advocate Reda Felyun, and she says this to me, well, if you instruct us to enroll this case when we tell you that the case is not ripe for such, we will say that you have instructed us to prosecute the case so that the accused person can get an acquittal. And that for me was too much to bear. And that is where the, the difference arose in the sense that I'm not going to have Advocate Halkhrain prosecuting the case. I have these people who are going who, who I have said, okay, now deal with the case and prosecute it. That's really where my problem actually began, with the, with the advice that Advocate Halkhrain had given. But it may have begun there, but it didn't end there, because his advice was multifold. He pointed out to you that you've had an inadequate record filed before this court that you required an adequate record, that there were 67 pages 
of what was three lever arch files, that there were supplementary affidavits to which there was no response filed, that documentation was incomplete, that there was no condemnation application before the court, um, um, that knowing all of this, there was an obligation on you to, to, to deal with the matter properly before the civil court. Besides the actual Amluli um, prosecution, being in mind that the civil application was precisely to set aside a decision taken in respect of the Amluli prosecution, that if you were, if you were going to fail in this application, based on, by then you'd had the Zuma judgment already, it would bring the underlying decision back to life. So, the, 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 the essence of what I'm asking you about the Halgrain advice is, besides the fact that you didn't agree with him on what he said on the prosecution of Richard M. Lully, he was highlighting to you that you are sitting with a court application heading straight to nowhere. Uh, did you disagree with him on that? As you, as you understand, I have not said I am expect, expect on civil on, on civil matters, but as I understood, the, the whole purpose of a review is to review a prosecutorial decision. I quite accept that there were challenges with regard to the to the supplementary affidavits. And I have explained in my application in the, I think, it, is it called the answering affidavit? Or, or it's an affidavit in the GCB matter, the issue about the supplementary affidavits because we have not received the supplementary affidavit that was actually filed by FUL. It lay dormant at the state uh, attorney's offices. So there were, there were responses as far as that is concerned, which is why when Advocate Hodes took it over, he saw nothing wrong with the Rule 53. And I accept that as councils, they have a right to, 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 to differ. And I, I did not have any reason to doubt the advice that was given by Advocate Mutimele. I hear that what he says in his, in, in his uh, memorandum, that he says that the Rule 53 was not sufficient and, and, and all of that. I hear that. But my main focus, uh, Chair, just to be, to be clear, was about reviewing a decision with the purpose of a prosecution. So, did you turn to Advocate Mohatla not being an expert on civil matters, now having been told by counsel that all is not well in how the civil litigation is running, knowing that it's actually her division that is meant to be responsible for, for this? Did you raise this? Now, her evidence was she was completely oblivious to this. That shocked me that she was actually complete, completely, completely oblivious to it because my understanding was that every step of the way, Advocate Mkhatla was being briefed by Advocate Tita. And you know, that is why it was easy for me to phone her at any point in time because I'm under the impression that we are together, she's getting briefed, and at no stage does she come to me and say, you know, this Advocate Tita, that I have allocated to you is now doing things in his own way. So that is, that, that, that is, that is how the matter then unfolded, yes. But you don't pick up the phone and speak to Advocate Mohatla after Advocate Halgrain briefs you on this matter, no? I did not pick up a phone to brief Advocate Mohatla, but my focus at the time was about the, the, the case itself. So I'm saying I go to the team that is supposedly engaged in the case. Maybe I should have picked up the phone to speak to Advocate Mohatla, but I did not pick up the phone because in that briefing, in that meeting itself, I was with his representative, Advocate Sita. So for me, who? Her representative. Okay. 
<laughs> I stand corrected. I was with Advocate Tita. So I, 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 I was really working under the impression that she, he is keeping her informed. But in hindsight, as you, as you say, probably I should have also gone an extra mile to, 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 phone, her, to phone her. But how Advocate Tita was presented to me by Advocate Mahatla was the fact that, and you heard her, you heard her singing about her, his own expertise and all of that, so I really had no doubt. You had no doubt in the face of being told by counsel that this entire case has now been mixed up, that all these kinds of things wasn't done. Were you under the impression that this was the state attorney's fault? Who, who was to blame for the situation that Algren advises you on? There's a lot of things that happened that should not have happened in that case. I can mention, I can mention some of them. From the beginning, we briefed SC. As you will see in my, in my GCB application, I explained that the delays that took place up until I came from maternity leave, which was in April. So if you read there, there are many things that, 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 that actually went wrong in, in, in terms of the process. So I will not say that the blame lay squarely on, on me as a person. I would say that there, is, there, is a, there was this kind of reliance that perhaps I should not have put, but I put a lot of reliance on the fact that Advocate Tidia is introduced to me by the whole head of LAD to say this is the person who's very much competent to deal with these matters. I'm not saying things went well in the, in the, in the litigation of, of that matter. When you're on maternity leave, who's acting in DPP? Uh, I think it was Dr. Ramayete. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. The entire period? Or did you just come in and out? No, I wouldn't be able to come in and out. <laughs> Some way somebody suggested that work got taken home to you. That's why I'm not sure whether there was actually an acting in DPP or whether you were managing things from home. No, I was not managing things from home. I think Dr. Ramayde was the person acting as NDPP. You ultimately took no decision to review, correct? The investigations? No, the, 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 the decision, yes. As far as you were concerned, investigations were ongoing and you were not going to review the decision. The investigations were ongoing and did a, a chairperson, so there was nothing to review. How long were you away for maternity leave? How long were you away? I went on January. January 2? To April. January to April? Yes, Chairperson. Date, dates? You don't remember? I have to check my... But January to April? Yes. You didn't know when the child was born? Shh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. You may proceed. If I can help you so that we get it right, your maternity leave was from 21st of January until 17th May. That was, that was the planned maternity leave, but my baby came on before the 21st of January. We in, we in 20... So the actual... 13. I just want to know how long you were away 
from the NPA. I, I was uh, I was away from the NPA from 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 the 16th, 17th uh, uh, January 2013. I think I came back then. Mm -hmm. What? April, May, not April, May. According to the leave form, <laughs> I came back in May. Okay, May. <laughs> oh. I don't know if I came back in May, really, or I was back in the office already by April, regardless of the fact that I must have said I'll come back in, in, in May. I wouldn't remember exactly when I reported, but what I do know is that I went before the 21st of, of January. And uh, Dr. Ramaite was acting for yes. that period? Yes, Chairperson Dr. Ramaite was, was acting during this, in my absence. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. So, did you have an opportunity to read the affidavits that was done by Advocate Samkwebi and Advocate Samzanyati in the matter at the time you settled your affidavit or you signed yours? I don't, I'm not sure, Chairperson, if I ever read their affidavit, because I, I, I don't think I had to confirm anything in their affidavits. I don't think I have read, I, I might have read them later at a certain point. You, you would have been aware what, it, what in consultation was meant. You, you don't... Uh, you don't dispute the ordinary meaning in law of what in consultation with means. No, I, I don't dispute that in law, what is meant. It is, it is just the, the practice. Now, on Friday, I led some evidence on a letter and a meeting that occurred between members of crime intelligence and Advocate Mkwebi. Were you aware of it? No, I was not aware of it. And the letter which I handed up, which you may have there, but you find it in the correspondence K2012, number five. It shows that the letter of the 31st of May, which comes subsequently, is hand-delivered both to you and um, Advocate Mkwebi. Did you receive this? When you showed it, uh, I could not really, when you showed it on Friday, I could not really recall whether I had received the letter. I can only be able to recall if I received the letter, perhaps if I were to see something, because probably if I had received it, I would have then maybe or my PA, if at least he had received, because he received correspondence, my, my executive secretary, when she receives correspondence, she then writes to the, to, the, to, the, to the person who must then deal with the matter. So, looking at the substance of the letter, does it ring a bell? Mm, no, it doesn't ring a bell at all. The only time a uh, chair if I may, I may, I may, I may say something. The only time that I, I got to know that there were other investigations with regard to to officials in crime intelligence was when we were briefed by Advocate Rita Felion and uh, Advocate Baker, and I remember in one of those brief briefings saying that you know you might have to meet together so that you, you don't work against each other. The other one makes another person a section 204 witness whilst the other, whilst the other team is particularly charging that person. So that particular leg of the case was then dealt with by Advocate Gerenel.
and Advocate Mukhari handled the disciplinary inquiry on behalf of the NPA, correct? Mukhari. Advocate, mm, mm, yes, he did. And did he keep you abreast of what was happening in the disciplinary inquiry? Uh, I would receive briefings from, particularly from Karen, ne? the 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 person who really briefed me on the disciplinary was Karen, and there were days, one or two days, not on so much many occasions where. I recall that Advocate Mukari came with a Ms. Beryl Similani in my office and also with TD and all of that, yes. But it's not like whenever she would come out of the disciplinary chain, the first stop that she must go to is my office. It was not something like that. You see, at the time, this consultation between Advocate Mkwebi and what I refer to on Friday is visitors from crime intelligence first made its appearance if, if he didn't disclose it to anybody in his evidence in the disciplinary inquiry. And it was then picked up by the media who then wrote an article which hit the news about precisely what was being said by crime intelligence um, in that regard. Did you not no knowledge of that at the time? No, Chairperson, I did not have any knowledge of that at the time, yes. Okay. I want to take you off the full matter and just hold on. and take you to a letter which you addressed to the minister on 4 March 2014 and the letter one will find at 4 March 2014. Just let me get it. Ah, J? No, it's not. J11? 24 March, that's right. Now, hold on. It's 4 March 20. It is J11. J11 is 4 March. 4 yes. March. Now, this is a memorandum which you addressed to the Minister of Justice. Correct? Yes, Chairperson. And you address this letter to the Minister of Justice because you are unhappy about certain decisions which are being taken by Mr. Nksana, correct? Yes, Chair. Yes, Chairperson. And you are asking the Minister to intervene? Yes, Chairperson. What was the nature of the intervention you expected the Minister to... to, to Chair, I don't mean to interrupt my colleague. My client is really desirous of a short break. I do understand. I just needed to do it at a convenient time, even for the question. Let's just get done with it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Yes. Yes. I'll do this quickly. What did you expect the minister to do? Like any a person who is responsible for the oversight of the of the NPA. I 
I, I was expecting him to, to intervene on my behalf. Okay. I was not happy. I was not happy with the, with the fact that I was uh, transferred to another business unit. And it is a common cause now that as deputy nationals, we become unhappy about being transferred to other business units. And also, it is perfect. Thank you. We can, we can take it further when we come back. Yes. Okay. We are Gen 4. Five. Five. How much time do you need? Five minutes enough? Five minutes. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Advocate Bauer, as you were saying. So my question to you was, as we ended it, and you may have answered it, I, I, at that point of the afternoon that I can't recall, what did you expect the minister to do? A, a chairperson that was just raising my concerns with the minister as, as, any, as any employee would do if he if she so deems a wish. Um, I considered the situation to me to be undesirable. I was just uh, seeking his intervention if, if he was in a position to do so. And you regarded the, in fact, your letter styled as would be a, a letter going off to a minister with the recommendations approved or not in the, in, in the sense of where there's a usual chain of command in the letter going up, as you expected a response to that, correct? I did expect a response. Did you get a response? No, I did not get a response from the minister at the time. Did you get a response at any time? I don't recall actually getting a response. Except that when Mr. Um, Mr. the minister now current, he, Mr. Masuta, he did come to address us as, a, as the, 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 the deputy national directors and, and, the, and the NTPP. He did come to address us. In fact, there is a certain irony, which I'm sure you recognize, you complain that you are being constructively dismissed and being set up to fail, and that the same is not happening to Mr. Hofmeyer. And then when Mr. Naksana leaves, Advocate Abrams does exactly the same thing to Mr. Hofmeyer. You, you're quite right, Chairperson. And at some point in time, as, as, as Deputy National Directors, we felt like gagging against now the, the, the NDPPs. Uh, you know, I I never. You know, despite the, despite everything that Mr. Hofmeyer had said uh, about me in the inquiry, I did not rejoice in his unhappiness because I've been there myself. I know when you are passionate about something, you're just passionate about it. But at the end of the day, with deputy national directors, we're powerless. The NDPP has got power to reshuffle us as, 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 as an NDPP deems fit. And if we look at the whole debate, you will recall about the Phillips matter, which ensued between uh, Mr. Hoffmeyer and Advocate Arensa. The document is J163, but I don't think for my purposes we necessarily need to go there. In your view, was the the national director of public prosecutions entitled to request the information from Mr. Hoffmeyer that he sought in that letter? I maybe he deemed it necessary to get the information from Mr. Hofmeyer. I wouldn't say no, he was not necessarily entitled, depending what he intended to do with the with the information. Th th once you finish those questions, will you let me know? I want to go back to a question that you've asked. No, no, ask it now, because I'm, I'm, I want to do a follow-up that I don't want you to disturb me, so ask, my question, ask your question first. <laughs> ask your question before. I was saying to the chair, the question that I was asked by Ms. Bauer is probably important, and she might not see the import of it. The 
reshuffling as if you are in a cabinet minister. Is there an expectation that you, the, the NDPP talks to the do deputies in this reshuffling process? Because surely if we talk about certainty and independence, we're not talking about just the NDPP, it ought to be you too. So that in a sense, when you have your, your deputies, they have a sense of office and length of office and those sorts of things that go with that. And it sounds to me that it's quite unsettling that you serve at the, what do they call it in the constitutional thing? No, there's a, there's a definite word about you serve at the pleasure of the pleasure. president, as it were. So you're serving at the pleasure of the NDPP, which doesn't sound to be an optimal way of doing things. And before you respond to that, another unsettling issue is also that you are deputy, you deputize the national uh, director. You get transferred from one enterprise or unit to the other. Did you, at some stage, discuss with Mr. Nasana the fact that you are not quite happy, if I may use the word, that you're being transferred? And if not, why not? I imagine this is your colleague. You know, you are, he's your immediate supervisor. The level of collegiality in a professional setting would, for me, require that there are open, mature discussions between you. Let me start by, the, by, by, by responding to your question. The long and short answer is that I did. I raised my happy, unhappiness even at the ex committing that consisted of deputy national directors. And you know, the person who responded in, in, in that particular meeting, Mr. Masana had told me in no uncertain terms that he, he has made the decision, he's not going to change it, and uh, that is his decision. So I raised it again in one of the ex committee. And you know what Mr. Willie Hofmeyer said to me? He then said to me that, you know, you must just learn to accept it. It's, it's, it what, it's what it is, those are the powers of the NDPP. That's why I say, you know, even though he said that to me at the time, I understood where he said when this thing, actually, when this change actually happened to him because it really did make him unhappy. And to, and to come to your... That, that sets the scene for mm. the answer to that question. Mm, mm, mm. And, and to come to your question, uh, is, is, is a, you have an expectation firstly, that your kind of, uh, for lack of a better word, your kind of expertise will be considered by, the, by, your, by your NDPP before he makes a, a decision to, to, to transfer you and put you in another portfolio. I but like he, she, don't forget. She. Thank, thank you, ma'am. Yeah, thank you, ma'am. It's just that it's history now that we have a woman NDPP. There has never been any woman NDPP before. So you have that expectation that the NDPP would take into account your expertise, but in reality, that is not what happens. We get to a meeting, and, uh, or you are called one by one, for example, and then you are told that uh, I've made a decision that this is what is going to happen or we get to an, to an ex committing and then you, you get to know that this is the decision, it's, it's what the NDPP has decided, because the act doesn't really protect us. If you read the NPA act, it doesn't really protect us. It protects the DPPs better. Yes, 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 Jane. It does protect the DPPs. And how did you operate? Did you operate differently? during your acting stint? Because there were also a number of changes made. The, the, the changes that I made did not relate to portfolios, essentially. They, they, they reverted back to an old structure 
that that previously existed. And my reason for that was that I'm not a hard worker like Advocates Melani. You know, Advocates Melani is a kind of a person who would stay in the office until it is so dark and he will be there on weekends. So for me, I wanted something which is going to be very easy that this one takes care of this and this one takes care of this portfolio and this one takes care of this particular portfolio. And during Advocates Melanie's era is that basically the DPPs were accountable, we were all reporting. So it was a kind of a centralized structure, which is why I, I felt like I, I, I really need and I appreciated that I have got a, uh, Mr. Hofmeyer, I've got uh, Dr. Ramayde, I've got uh, Advocate Mohadla, and I knew that they have particular expertise. Yes. I think what I just needed to know is whether you did things differently by consulting before you take decisions. Yeah, yes, I think that's yes. What I wanted to yes, know. I did. Yes. That was the whole purpose of the meeting that took place, the famous meeting which is referred to the 24th and the 25th of, of January. But before then, I have had a meeting with, the, with, the, with, with what I call the mini exco. We've met and we have uh, discussed that we are going to call a meeting that consists of everybody else. And these are the issues that we are going to deliberate upon. Yes. Thank you. Now, one of the difficulties and that does appear from the correspondence that have occurred between you and Mr. Naksana was his complaint that you did not provide him with a handover report. That he, he asked you several times, he sought to get the background from you because he effectively took over from you as the acting NDPP. You orally indicated to him um, that you're working on it, but he never got a response. I think my my challenge at that time, a uh, uh, chairperson, was I, I did not understand what is this handover report because I have given Mr. Nasana a briefing many so many times. I briefed him on the structures that he ought to attend. I took him with on the structures that we are actually attending. That is now, I even explained the role of all the deputy national directors. I explained that there are cases that he might want to be briefed, and these cases are dealt with by so and 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 so. So I think from where I, I said, and you must understand the, atmos the atmosphere at the time was an atmosphere of fear. I had fears that something really was, 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 was set up to, to, to happen to me. That's a very loaded statement that's going to lead to me asking you why. Because I can understand that despite the commitment to gender equality, it is a relatively unknown person that comes and takes over the job you're doing. Isn't that so? It's not a case of you taking over his job. He's coming into the catbird seat. So why would you be concerned about him? Uh, maybe you must repeat your question. I'm not following, but why would I be concerned about him? Yeah. I was not concerned about, about, uh, about, Mr. about the former NDPP, Mr. Mason. I'm saying to you, those were not normal times. And you must remember that I'm saying I had given him a, 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 I have advised him on how this institution operates. I have told him about the structures that we participate in, the NEECs, the JCPS, the JCPS uh, cluster committees and what is actually reported in there and that the files are there. These are the files that relate to the NEEC and these are the files that relate to the JCPS clusters. There are DPPs, the DPPs are in the provinces. If you need to know anything about any case, they are best placed and suitable to brief you about those particular cases. Now, what you are referring to, the time when these actual 
uh, reports were actually when they were actually required from me. I knew at that time because remember that is the NPA. In the NPA, as you would know, things leak in the NPA. The very same people that I assume that he was sitting with in the, in the meeting were able to tell me what is actually happening. And as you later saw that then there was, there were advocates who were briefed with a view that this kind of process must take place, charges were then laid against me. So it was not a really conducive atmosphere. And I did consult with, a, with council and I took advice. And that advice was just to not respond to his letters at all. The advice was it was sufficient that he has got the reports that he is actually looking for. So it is in that there's nothing further that I can actually give to him. So let me take you to K65 where he, I think it's K J65. This is the one where he asks you, these are the findings in the Zuma case um, that are being made against you. Um, I consider this to be serious. Please provide me with your comment. Do you respond to this? You see those dates, there was already a very unhealthy Unhealth, one of the unhealthiest uh, uh, conditions that I operated under in the NPA, I felt like I was a persona non grata in that institution. So when I received this letter, you can see that these letters, even though they don't tell me that we are starting a process, they were actually starting a particular process. And I was wary in, in giving response that are going to land me up in trouble without obtaining legal advice. But my question was, you don't respond at all? I did not respond in writing. Did you respond early to him? The briefing on the Zuma, is this the Zuma matter? Yes, mm -hmm. he had already received the briefing of, 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 of this matter. He had received, he had been briefed on, on, on all of these matters. He had, been, he had received briefings. Even on the boys in matter, he had received briefings. And those briefings were given in my absence because exercising his discretion, he decided not to invite me or include me in those particular meetings, as you would see in the statement that is compiled by Advocate Mozing. Sorry, sorry, Ms. Noe. Just, just let's understand the, the, the timeline. This questionnaire, as it were, is dated, if I could, 20th of October. When did Mr. Masana assume office? 2013. September 2013. 2013. 2013. August, actually. I think it's August. August 2013. By May, between August 2013 and October 2014, had he asked you about other other matters where he wanted briefings? No, 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 not not really, Chairperson. When he came to assume office, I made an appointment to see him in his part in his office uh, as an NDPP, and I provided a kind of round of a briefing. I because at that time we we're going to go to Parliament. So I had to brief him on, on the report itself that we are going to present in Parliament. So in that, I even made arrangements uh, to say that for those cases that you want to be, briefed, to be briefed about, which are quite important, the DPPs in the provinces are best placed to brief you on those cases. And I know that he did receive reports about those cases. I understand another timeline, Ms. Bauer. This is the 20th of October. When did he get into trouble and leave? Understand the timeline. If you recall... He stayed 
It wasn't more than a year, am I correct? He's actually formally appointed on the 1st of October 2013. So we're both wrong with, with uh, August and September. And he is there. Um, he, he takes the decision to shift them around in March 2014. Um, he restructures the office in April while we on a timeline. Um, he's... Uh, in roughly 15th August 2014, he approaches the court to interdict his suspension and obtain information. Um, 2014. 2014, and um, He, the Commission of Inquiry is appointed on 5th February 2015. Um, and he signs a settlement agreement with the President on the 9th of May 2015. So, so the, we will try and put together a timeline for you of events that happened. But it, it seems as... There's lots more going on in between stuff. But what I'm trying to, figure, to, to establish is by, as we say, July, he's already in trouble. 2014. If I take you to J101, which is the letter he sends you on the first, uh, on the... 9th of September 2014, which he refers back to the letter we sent you on the 1st of July 2014. I wanted to take you to the 1st of July one, but I just can't seem to lay my hands on it. But he sums it up in this letter. Hmm? No, no, it's not. It's dated wrong. It's September. Um, he, he details in there that he asked you for reports on the full matter, the poisons matter, the busasa matter, and the megos matter. He asked you for the keys and an inventory on the safe. He asked you for your appearance certificate in the high court. Um, he reminded you about this. He attached copies again. Um, this, and then he notes, despite undertakings to provide me with it, by up to now you have still not done so. Um, he asks you for the documents in respect of the state versus Mendelo matter. Um, and then at the end he says you haven't dealt with, you haven't responded to the Yakub inquiry and can you indicate whether you're going to. And that's the letter dated the 9th of September 2014. So if one looks at this letter, it's not just simply cases. It seems to be, this letter sums up all the stuff that he asked you that he says you've not responded to. And I simply want you to comment on it. That's exactly my point, Chairperson, that these reports were submitted to Mr. Nwasana by those who knew even better than I did. The only issue was this uh, key. There was a particular key that I must have received from, uh, from Mr. Hofmeyer, and it was a key to a particular safe. And I just couldn't know for the life of me where did I put this key, because remember now, I have moved from the office where I was. I, I had moved in a very abrupt manner from, from the office where I was downstairs. Now I'm upstairs, so I'm trying to 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 think where is this particular key so eventually we looked for the key in a safe i think we must have found the key in a safe i don't know where we found the key but we found the key 
and we're not even looking for the key when we found it. We found it accidentally. It was a big, longish key that uh, Mr. Hofmeyer had given to me. And I don't know whether I gave it to the security and risk person or I gave it to Mr. Abrahams, but I handed over the key in any event. My point was that you, you see, uh, Advocate Jiba, it works both ways. It seems as if, as you as DNDPP is at the mercy of the NDPP, there isn't much the NDPP can do if the DNDPP doesn't want to play ball with it, with the NDPP either. Would you agree? You all no, appointed by the president. Mm. The uh, and, and I haven't worked out my mind in mm. my mind how much is required for a Section 12.6 inquiry, because it cannot be that everything that the NDPP doesn't mm -hmm. like or the president doesn't like must result in a 12.6 inquiry. Mm -mm. But it seems as if what Advocate Naksana is complaining about, or Mr. Naksana, is that he wasn't able to get you to cooperate with him. Ms. Bauer, let me say it in this fashion. Advocate Van Rensbeck has testified here about the whole Mendelo case. That report was sitting with Mr. Nelson. So I have not, as you were cross-examining me here, you were even saying that whatever I knew is something that I have heard. I was not hands-on in the particular case. So these are the reports. All I'm saying to you is that these were the reports that Mr. Nasana had at the end of the day. And I knew that everything is being done to get on to me at that particular time. The atmosphere was not a friendly atmosphere. And bear in mind that when Mr. Ngata, Mr. Ngasana came to the office, I went to his office and I briefed him on everything that I could possibly brief him upon. I took him through the, the, the report. The annual report of the NPA is too big. But I made time, I took him through everything which was contained into that so that he can be able to present the, my performance, the performance by the NPA during my particular era. Let me just get some clarity. You say Mr. Nasana asked for some reports from you. And you know that there were people who provided him with, that, with those reports. Is it eventually, or did you ask those people to provide him with the reports that he asked from you? Or did he get those reports because he gave up on you? No, he didn't get the reports because he gave up on me. In one of the minutes, I just don't remember which minutes now were handed over by, by Mr. Hofmeyer. Immediately after the judgment in the Boysen case came, I called the prosecutors and I said, colleagues, you need to prepare a thorough report for the, for the NDPP. So I have asked this report, I have asked even Advocate Mkwebe to prepare a thorough report for the NDPP with regard to the Mdluli case, and I believe that he had prepared that report. The only person that I never asked to prepare a report was, a, was Karen, because I knew they were having their own meetings, but I do know that Karen and uh, and Sis Beryl had taken had taken him through the the whole ma some of the f high profile matters that were being dealt with, which is what led him to make a decision to withdraw the review application which was filed in the Labour Court against a, a, the the acquittal on the charges uh, that Advocate Pretenbach had. So you asked those other people to provide him with the reports that he was looking for, that you could not provide him I with? I did, Chairperson, I did. The minutes, I don't know which minutes, those minutes would bear me out. I did ask f the whole team, for example, in the poison matter, and I they prepared more than a report, they prepared presentations. And, and you will see from the, from the statement that is written by, by Advocate Mozing that when he was getting those briefings, I was not particularly there. Yes. You also say that uh, you 
as soon as Mr. Masana came, you asked for an appointment with him. Did you ever get that appointment so that you can report to him? Yes, you, I, 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 went to, I went to his office okay. because the following day, I think we we're going to go to the JCPS cluster meeting, something to that effect, yeah. I, 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 he gave me, I think the better part of the day, we're actually sitting together in, he, in, his, in, his, in his office. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just want clarity on whether, in, in the midst of all these letters that Mr. Masana is sending to you, did you at any point, whether it was oral, because I understand you may not have written anything to him on advice, did you at any point say to him, I, I've actually requested the teams that are working on these matters to, pro to provide you with the written reports, and I understand that they've actually provide you, provided you with written reports. It is the very same reports that I would have actually received from the very people. Did you ever have that kind of a conversation with Mr. Nassan or did you just leave it hanging? In the, in the meetings that would have, because he would raise it in the meetings as well, I would, uh, I would say, but you have the reports. I know for a fact that this A, B, C, D, E had actually happened. So in the meetings that we would have. Thank you. Thank you, Chairperson. Arising from a, a, a comment that you made, Ms. Bauer, if you recall, I asked about serving at the, at the, what word did I use? At the pleasure. The deputies, she says it goes both ways, and I'm, I'm intrigued by it, because indeed it has to go both ways. How do, how do you exert disciplinary behavior or behavior that complies if you don't if you if you're not empowered to do it in a sense every time some, there's an infraction you have to either have a section 12 by the uh, 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 instituted by the president how does the ndpp hold the, the deputies to account or the dpps in such an unworldly kind of situation Ideally, and before you respond to that, and tell me, tell us, is that has that become normal usually at the NPA? Has it become usual, or was it only because, as you say, this was a different time? A lot of things were happening at the time, or has that become a normal working environment at the NPA? Has that become a normal working environment it's where all, all these difficulties, yes. people not uh, consulting with each other, people not seeming or said and not to cooperate with each other, you know, all these tensions because it seemed like from the way you describe the, this particular period, it seemed like that was a tension filled environment, working environment. And it is for that reason that things were not turning out the way they should be turning out so that today we have a section 12 and six inquiry. Just, just fill us in, take us into your confidence and describe the atmosphere for us so that we can understand these happenings in context. You are away from what you wanted to do, but I think this is important. Yeah. You know, the chairperson, the, 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 the working conditions, if I may say, of the deputy national directors are quite, are quite difficult. They're quite difficult in the sense that you, you really depend at the pleasure of the national director of public prosecution. Some, to the extent that DPPs have said so many times that, you know, I do not want to work at head office because there's just no certainty. 
as to what you are actually tomorrow you are here the other day you are here and naturally those things they do create tensions between between ourselves as deputy national directors first and between that particular affected deputy national director and 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 the and the national director then you become a situation arises whereby it's going to appear as though these other deputy national directors are the favorites of the NDPP. And then this particular one is not a favorite of the NDPP. And these things, we, what, we, what has happened is that as deputy national directors, we have all failed to address them with frankness and openness to the national directors. Because the national directors, they find us there. We are supposed to be the ones to say, hang on, if you are to do this, it is not going to be, the, to be in the best interest of the organization. So one way or the other, as deputy national directors, we have failed, we ought to take responsibility for the fact that we have failed to, to put the, and to explain to the national director why it is not advisable to do things in a particular fashion. What we then do, you are on your own, essentially. As Mr. Hofmeyer was, say, was, was saying here, that he was particularly unhappy about being taken to, to, to legal affairs division. But none of us deemed it fit as deputy national directors to address the NDPP and say, hang on, this cannot be correct. None of us did that including myself, because I felt like when I was facing challenges myself, he did not do anything as well. Thank you. I have an idea. Thank you, Chairperson. And, and if we have regard to the evidence of Advocates Malochwa and Advocates Mukhatla, uh, they expressed a very similar view of we are not in a position to question, so we didn't ask. It's not a view that is simply linked to one NDPP. It seemed to have been prevailing even in your period, Advocate Jiba, if I listen to, to that evidence. The, the issues, I, I, I don't want you to, to, to compare the uncomparables. The issue with Advocate Mukhadla is one, is that then she was placed into Legal Affairs Division. She was never moved from Legal Affairs Division. The only thing that happened was that when we all took a decision in that famous meeting in January, was that the functions which fell under the head of NPS will result under NPS. So she was part and parcel of that particular meeting. It's not to say that she wasn't in that particular meeting. She was there as well as a deputy national director. I, I just, for the sake of completeness, want to sh say to you that under folder F2, 2.11 to 15 of the other Naksana letters, and one sees from uh, if you look at 2.12, he addresses the letter to Advocate Mkhwebi, we 1st July where he says he took office on the 1st of October, he'd not been privy to an official handover report, and he seeks the background on the full application, which advocate Mkhwebi then provides him on the 14th of July, which is 2.214, and he must have put in a similar request to advocate Mzanyati, because he provides him with a response on the 14th of July as well, and if you go to Uh, 
I've lost it, but I think there's one where Advocate Norco also provides a response um, on the three other matters. Ah, 2.211, where she provides a report 14th of July to do that. So, so, so he hadn't only asked you for your comments, he had in fact asked them as well. As a parent from the correspondence. Yes, you, you, you did ask them, but that doesn't depart from the fact that I had requested. I've even requested the DPPs in the Western Cape because at the time there was a case that is still not even finalized or it, it has just been recently finalized. It, date back, it dated back from the era of uh, Mr. Nguka. I've asked Advocate Duco that you must please make sure that you provide the NDPP with a report on just that particular case. Can we can we turn off the hand over and talk about the pseudo trip to Mauritius for a moment, the one that ended up in Durban? Now it it seems it it seems as if if one follows the flight plan, it's a trip into Durban and a trip out of Durban, and you say it's not you, right? It it is no, Jefferson. It, it, it certainly wasn't the person sitting here testifying today. H have you been asked about this by anybody, by any other, by the Inspector General, by Crime Intelligence? H has there been some sort of an investigation into this? I was asked by the Inspector General. We had a meeting in his office, and I responded to him uh, as, as such, that you know what, I know nothing about this. And uh, I do know for a fact that the police, at some point in time, we're conducting an investigation, and I don't know where the investigation, how did the investigation unfold and, and, and all of that. And I said to him, this is where I prefer to, to leave it. I do not want to engage any further on the matter. He continued, I think he wrote so at some point in time, and I spoke to, uh, what is his, where is he? Jay Gavender. I, I communicated with Jay Governor that I've given them my response and, and that's where it ends. Now, if one looks at the chronology, the flight is said to happen on, on the 9th of September 2010, which is now, which is now nine, eight years ago, right? And Part of the reason, if one looks at what the narrative out there is, some of them have linked it to the fact that the president granted your husband a pardon on the 8th of September 2010. Do you have any comment on that? I don't know when he was granted pardon, on what date he was granted pardon. And it is not very long after that that um, in fact, it's three months off before you become the Deputy National Director of Public Prosecutions. Is that correct? Yeah, it's December 2010. December 2010, I was appointed as a Deputy National now, Director, yes. The pardon that was granted to your husband. And this goes back to my question on questions of perceptions and, and perceptions of bias, which I must be honest, I haven't quite worked out the role in my head of where it fits into any kind of an inquiry. But it does seem, and, and advocate, and the, the then president granted the pardon at the time, and a few months later, we have the DA versus Zuma matter in, in the, there, there are decisions being taken in the Zuma matter, which is an ongoing matter. Should you not have recused yourself from, from that, any discussions or decisions or, or things to, relating to the president so that there's no perceptions of bias involved? I didn't see any, I still don't see, I don't see way, why I would have uh, recused myself because remember, the decision has already been made, the important decision, whether to prosecute or not, has already been made. What is just being processed now is a submission of some record. So 
my role there is not going to save the president in anything because the decision has already been made by Advocate Mshe not to prosecute, as we all have heard. So you're saying the, the way they've sought to join the dots has gone skew? I think it went skew because the decision was already made. There's nothing really that I am going to be able in the life of me to, ask, to be able to assist the president with. And, and as we heard, uh, Chairperson, you have heard you, and you have seen the affidavit which at length was written by Mr. Hofmeyer on the reasons why he felt strongly that these charges should not stand. That affidavit is the latest affidavit that he has got to file. And of everybody in the NPA who was able to do that analysis and educate us about what had actually happened, it was Mr. Willie Hofmeyer. So I don't see how I would be biased in anything at all. We heard evidence on Friday about a prosecutor why being linked to allegations of wrongdoing. Would you have expected that to have been brought to the attention of the National Director of Public Prosecutions? If, if you were a senior member of the NDPP and you told about allegations of prosecutor involved in wrongdoing, do you expect that senior member of the NDPP to bring it to the attention of the NDPP? I, I ask you this, and let me put this into your context, because I try to draw an analogy. Mr. Mendelo comes to Advocate Samalani with allegations about Advocate Breitenbach. And, yes. And Advocate Samalani has a meeting with senior people. He delegates out how it's dealt with, and there's a process put in place in respect of Advocate Breitenbach, based solely on allegations that is made by somebody who's involved in litigation. And, and I want to ask you, do you regard that to be the appropriate way in which allegations are dealt with within the MPA? When they are brought formally, yes. You, you, you must understand that Mr. Mendel brought these, these complaints in a very, very, very formal manner. You know, let me say this to you, Chairperson. There are so many complaints that are brought against our prosecutors by various persons. And not in all those complaints that we, we normally conduct a fully blown investigation. Because you, 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 you have a sense that not everybody is going to be happy with the decision which is made by a particular prosecutor. So the, the, it's a judgment call, really, that you make at a particular time. I just don't know which one are you referring to, uh, Ms. Bauer. Maybe if you can point me directly so, to what you are referring to, then I, I'll be I'm able to answer. I'm referring to the meeting which Advocate Mkwebe has with members of crime intelligence, who brings to his attention that in the course of these investigations, a certain prosecutor is involved in, in wrongdoing. And Advocate Mkwebe is informed of this on a confidential basis. And as I understand it, he doesn't tell you anything about it. And I want to know if that is what is expected of senior members of the prosecuting service. Be, bear in mind that he regarded his visitors to be quite senior members within crime intelligence. They, they were pretty senior members within crime intelligence, not just him regarding it. I think I would say that uh, he, he had the right to exercise his own discretion on how he chose to deal with the matter. So, Finally, I, I want to come to your qualifications because I think that is uh, underlying, and I'm not talking about your academic qualifications. I'm talking about your, you were only admitted as an advocate in 2010, correct? Yes. You were not an attorney prior to that. 
I just passed the 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 board exams. I did not go into practice as an attorney. You were not admitted as an attorney. You were not an attorney. Why do you have to be admitted again? Like so, admitted as an advocate or something? Yes. Yes. No. 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 I did not uh, do the admission. I passed. So, so, so an an attorney is one who is defined as one who is admitted as an attorney under the Act. Okay. So I, I ask you these questions because it seems as if as a criteria to be appointed as a Deputy Director of Public Prosecutions, you needed to have rights of appearance in the High Court under the Rights of Appearance Act. And it seems as if, if you were not admitted under an attorney, how did you get rights of appearance to become a Deputy Director of Public Prosecutions? I don't know you're asking me. I do not know to those that appointed me what they considered, Ms. Baba. I, I wouldn't be able to answer that question. Okay. Thank you. I have no further questions. Sorry, let me try and understand that answer. And maybe it's because I haven't got the act in front of me. There's criteria for admission. Would I be correct in the act itself? Admissions as an advocate. No, no, no. Admission. To, uh, no, I'm sorry. As a, as appointment, not admission. Appointment. Sorry, it's section 15.2 of the NBA Act. Are we able to bring it up? I'm just trying to understand that answer. What, what subsection is that? Oh, you can't see. <laughs> it's Ms. Bauer, 15? Section 15.2 of the Act. Which, which Act is this one? The National Prosecuting Act. Oh, okay. I thought you were showing me the Attorney's Act. No, no, the only reference to the Attorney's Act was that you are an attorney if you are admitted as an attorney. I'm waiting. The, 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 the subsection, we've got lawyers here who are busy whispering. Maybe they'll give me an answer. It says a person shall only be appointed, shall only be appointed. Sounds like it's mandatory. Would you agree with me? As a deputy director, you were appointed as a deputy director. Uh, in, uh, as your first appointment, you were appointed as a deputy director. Uh, I was appointed as a senior state advocate, and then I became a deputy director, then a deputy national director. Hold on. The, f the first one was a senior state advocate. Yes. A senior state advocate uh, uh, chairperson is a rank. In the, in the, oh, it's just a rank. Oh, it's a rank. It's a rank. So that's again. how you entered the NPA? No. 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 As a... As a, you entered as a prosecutor. As a prosecutor. Yeah, I think that's important. And as yes. a prosecutor, you could have a BURIS, for instance. You, you could have a BURIS yeah. or have oh, a BPROC. And, yeah. But if you're going to be appointed as a deputy director, Section 15.2 then has criteria. Yes, Chairperson. And, and this criteria would seem to me A is mandatory. Would I be correct? Sorry. Shall says it's mandatory. You shall have the right to appear. Yes. And I think what Ms. Bauer was trying to figure out was, did you have the right of appearance? Oh. Remember, as an attorney, as an advocate, both of them have rights of appearance, but 
with, an, with the advocate, it's really by operation of the law. Mm. With an attorney, remember I was an attorney in my former life, Mr. Majavu. As an attorney, you then apply Section. for rights of appearance. Either, either, either you're, you're, you, you, in those days, you'd, you'd have to have a right of appearance. I see you shaking your head. Let me, let's let me talk, understand. Let's that. talk about Ms. Jiba's days. Yes. So, are you appointed as a DD in terms of Section 2 and Section 3, Subsection 4 of the Right of Appearance and Courts Act? Were you appointed under that section? Do you have rights of appearance? Because that's the only way you then get appointed, unless I'm not understanding. You look puzzled yourself. Yes, Chairperson, I'm puzzled myself, but I was appointed as a deputy director. At the time, I was a, appointed as a deputy director of public prosecutions in the DSO. So I, I don't know whether we operated under something different or, or, or what, but that's where no. I, was, I was appointed. I think we're going to have to establish, I think Ms. Bowers, difficulty is at the time that you are ad ap appointed, it would seem that you didn't qualify in terms of this section. Would I be correct in saying that? Or do you want to go and check it up? In so far, if you say I didn't qualify because I in was terms not of 15, admitted. 15.2a. 15.2b is a different uh, mm. uh, qualification. I mean, it's, it, it's conjunctive to a, but a says you must have letter. this. Can I check my appointment letter, Chairperson? Because my appointment letter would just release, would just enable me to give you an answer. It, you were appointed in 2001. Yes. You only get appointed as an advocate in 2010. Admitted. So, admitted as an advocate. I did my admission a, at that time, yeah. Yeah. So, e essentially what perplexed me was you wouldn't have been having rights of appearance under Section 2 of the Act, and you wouldn't have been having rights of appearance under Section 3.4 of the Rights of Appearance Act because you were not an attorney able to get that, that rights of appearance. Let me, just, let me just check. That's why I'm saying, uh, uh, Ms. Bauer, if you would allow me, I would want to go and check my appointment letter. I do know that many of us were appointed as deputy directors at that time. If, if I may, it's 4 o'clock. If you will... We'll start off with that question tomorrow. Is that I mean, Wednesday? I'm I'm done. I don't know how long Mr. Masuku is going to be. Whether we could no, finish Advocate Jiba today and then just stand that over. Um, where can we get hold of? Can we get hold of your appointment letter I must online? Request it. Something. Give him an opportunity to uh, then we can I, give I, you an opportunity so, so to So again, again, I'm, I'm I'm constrained to raise the issue of relevance because the inquiry's scope of terms of reference require you to look at whether she is fit and proper to be appointed as an NDPP. As a deputy now, as, sorry, as a, as a, as a deputy uh, national director of proper position. Now you're asking questions about her appointment as a, as a DPP. Now, you, you know, when she was a, a, a senior state advocate, she appeared in court. That's not a, that's not a, that's not a secret. So she must have a desire, right of appearance to appear in court as a senior state advocate. It's a legal issue that we can, we can, we can, we can investigate and, and, and give, you, give you answers to. But I, I, only two questions. Now it's 4 o'clock. No, no. And maybe I should uh, I wait until tomorrow. No, tomorrow I'm I think <laughs> you're questioning the relevance of the question. If the question has to do with her right of appearance, and qualification to be appointed as deputy director, then it answers directly to the question, the, to the section 12, six question. Yes. We think so. Yes. Depending on how you interpret section 2A, then uh, I think we would like to know. Understand, you'd probably want to know more than just uh, the, D the DPP, but I'm 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 here defending uh, Jiba's I mean, advocate Jiba's uh, a fitness for office to a specific a specific office. Ma so the questions that are being asked here are questions that puzzle me. 
but but uh, you want to know them, so we'll try and find answers for for them. And and I would like to. Good to know. Yeah. Perhaps, ma'am. Perhaps uh, just just as a pro amica or pro bono, whatever you wish to call it. Uh, <laughs> section section nine one of of the act. If I can if I can just read it. it says that a, a person. The qualifications for appointment as national director, deputy national director, or director. Any person to be appointed as national director, deputy national director, or director must possess legal qualifications that would entitle him or her to practice in all courts in the Republic. That would entitle you to do so if you applied. It doesn't say you must be admitted to a PSO. You must just hold those. So to, if, you had, if, you, if you had the qualifications to be admitted, because this isn't the civil courts that we know, they're appearing a state on behalf of the state. Even prosecutors who appear on behalf of the state in courts every day don't have qualifications that would allow them to appear if they were appearing for the defense. Um, Mr. Pramiko, can sorry. I say to you, Mr. Yes, Pramiko, that we're not looking at the same section. This, no, this no, but is I'm the saying this section. Of national this? director. We're not looking at this okay. section. We're looking at the NPA Act. It's the no, Deputy Act. National yeah. Director. It's the same Act. It's and the same Act. The right, the, right to, the right to appear, Section 2A. Yes, but, but, Section 15. But it, it doesn't matter whether you have the... Whether, Subsection 2 But that a. might be the right to appear. But yes. the, the requirements to be appointed as a Deputy National Director is set out in Section 9.1, ma'am, which is... which. Deputy national directors don't need to appear. If they, they can be appointed as a deputy national director without appearance. Mr. Mr. Ripping, no, sorry. We're looking at oh, no, no, okay. the appointment, the qualifications for the appointment of a deputy director. Not a deputy national. director. Yeah. Deputy director. Yes. Not a national. Um, I'm going to argue this in due, in due course as well, and and, and, and I don't know. I think it will probably also come up with uh, your legal yes. arguments. Yes. But what we are looking at right now yes, I is the. That. But that's irrelevant. Appointment yeah. of a deputy. It, it can't be relevant. How do you become a deputy director? Yes, ma'am. But it can't be relevant. And I have to share. I'm going to. We're going to argue a lot about this on Wednesday. What is relevant and what is not relevant in this inquiry. I think but so. I don't know how it can be relevant when a person was appointed in 2010, if they fit and proper to hold a completely different post in 2019, which is what this is inquiry is about. So, so I, I've sat here, and because I know it's, a, it's an inquiry and we haven't tried to, lim we don't want to limit it, and there's public interest and all of the like of that. But the greater majority of this evidence is totally irrelevant to answer the question. What someone was doing in 2004 Mr. Mr. Rib, I think we're going to stop you, no. No, we're going to stop you because the issues of relevance, you will argue will when you've argue, got, the, we've got an opportunity to argue. Yes, Not sir. today at five past four when I, I pose the question to the witness. And the witness has said, I will answer that question if you give me time to answer the question. You interpose yes, for sir. no reason at all to argue relevance. And I'm saying, that Mr. Masuka has said, I say, and I submit it's irrelevant, but I will address you. And we've said, Mr. Masuku, feel free to do so. I don't see how we can then entertain your coming and telling us that this, these issues are, are, are irrelevant. You will argue that. It was not, the question was not directed to you, no to your client, I'm afraid. Madam, Madam also, no, with no, great no. respect, we have, we have every right to say whatever we wish to in the interest of our client. We take note of you and we will keep quiet then. It's not the first time you've told me to keep quiet. Thank you, ma'am. Can I, can I just remind you also that the section 12.6 question is asked now. So everything that happened before now may or may not be relevant. Okay. Thank you. Will you finish today, Mr. Sure. You done. You done. Um, Mr. Masuku, will you do? Your can I, can I, can I then, pe perhaps can I do, well, if, if tomorrow is open. I mean, I, day after tomorrow. You want to do it now? We can sit until 6 o'clock, it's fine. Can I then take just a, a, a five-minute break to, to see what, just so to Mr. Masuk, if I may be the pro amico in this one, your client really wants to, to, to break now. So I think you should give her an opportunity to, 
to have you have your say on Wednesday. Have, she has been looking uncomfortable for the whole afternoon. I understand that, but I, I, I'm sorry, I, I have not spoken to you to know that, that, that that's a position. When I, when I do speak to my instructing attorney, uh, I will know what, what, uh, what Advocate Jiba wishes to do in five minutes if you give us the break. She may well, because I, I, I didn't have many questions to ask until the last question, uh, which, which, as I say, I, I don't believe is relevant at all, but you have a different view to it. And, but I, I, will, I, will, I will take, if you allow us for five minutes, we will, I can just put my head together on what I should do with, with my attorney and then come back to you and, and, and let you know whether whether we, we need 30, 10 minutes or 20 minutes or at the scope of our re-examination. It won't be, I don't believe it will be wrong, it will be long. Uh, I had three questions before, before this question. Will you be all right with that, Ms. Chiba? Can you stay longer? Yes, 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 Chairperson. Only if we just take a five minute break, then I can try and stay longer. All right. We're not going to go out. We'll give you an opportunity to consider what you want to let us know, okay? We'll wait here for you for five minutes. Can you do it now, Mr. Masuku? Yeah, yes, we will, we'll, I will, we'll do the re-examination now uh, with the understanding that the, we'll deal with the last question as a written, as a written question. <clears throat> Advocate Jiba, you were asked not once, maybe three times to give answers to what is a public narrative. 
in your work as a senior leader of the NPA, does it concern you that there's a public narrative somewhere out there um, about, you know, the public narrative either through the media or through uh, professors or through uh, students or through whoever has something to say about the NPA? Does it concern you when you perform your functions? It should never concern you because there's danger if you are going to take into account what is said in the, in the public as a narrative when you are about to make a decision on somebody else's life. You must recall the, the public itself. There's a silent public there's also a vocal public. So the danger if you are to take into account what is said about the, about, by the vocal public is that you don't know what is about, about the non-vocal public. So basically, you should stick to what is contained in your, in your policy, what binds you in the constitution and the, and the policy directives. So in a way, the, the Parties that have litigated against you, uh, both in your in your um, in your position as a, an acting national director of public prosecution, is FUL, and the Democratic Alliance, and um, the GCP. Would you consider that to constitute a public narrative or a narrative for which um, you should, as an MPA, be concerned, unless the issues are brought before the courts? One should be concerned about the issues which are rather brought before the courts. I've made an example. I don't know if I've made this example, Council. Uh, Chairperson, sorry. I must not keep on addressing you. I don't know if I've made this example, Chairperson. It might not be a good example to make, but I assume I'm in a protected space here that I'm able to make that example. I was on special leave when there was a lot of uh, uh, attention and public uh, noise about the emails in the media space, the emails that related to, the, to a family called the Gupta family and, 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 and how the NPA was not acting and all of that, with the result that what then I could see when I came back from special leave based on the report and the briefing that the acting special director gave then and, and, the, and, and, and the team of his prosecutors was that, you know, there wasn't really sufficient evidence to even make a decision to institute a prosecution at that time. But I think the, the pressure was brought to bear that something must happen. And it seemed like the NPA is sitting and not doing anything. So that is why I'm saying that it's very important that we, we don't succumb to what the narrative says in the public. So the, the narrative uh, issue was, was uh, testified to quite at large by um, Mr. Hofmeyer that there is a uh, perception, a narrative that the NPA prosecutes people of a, I mean, prosecute people who are involved in um, combating corruption um, and, and, and in certain instances people who are a minority in the ruling party. Was there evidence that you could respond to, sensibly respond to in, rela in relation to that narrative? As I, as I said, I, I do not know what informed Mr. Hofmeyer's uh, testimony in talking about the minority and the majority that is in the ruling party that is then uh, 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 prosecuted. <coughs> I could not find any, any basis for, for him for having been able to say, to say that. 
Now, when you make prosecutorial decisions, does it matter what the public says out there? As I've said, Chairperson, that it shouldn't matter at all because, you know, a, a person could be labelled as the most dangerous person in, in, in life. But then what should guide you at the time is what is then presented, is, is the evidence that, that is available at the time, regardless of the fact that the person is labelled as the most dangerous person at the time. If that cannot be substantiated, then it's something that you should not because it's going to, it's going to make you exercise your discretion in a very biased manner towards this particular individual. So you'd rather be guided by what is actually presented before you. Yeah. You, say, oh, sorry, I was on. you say a person shouldn't or a prosecutor shouldn't succumb to public pressure in making a decision whether to prosecute or not. In your experience at the NPA, do you think there was a tendency for prosecutors to succumb to media or public pressure to make decisions to act on media reports of criminality or so? I've used that, just this one example that related to the to the to the Gupta emails because when I got the report, we engaged with the prosecutors. I wouldn't want to say what were their responses, but we engaged with the prosecutors and really Dr. Ramete was extremely worried that we could foresee that this case is not going to be able to, pros to, to proceed on the date in which it is up because really the, we, we had insufficient evidence at the time. We have not even obtained evidence through mutual legal assistance from the banks that would have helped us to unravel this whole scheme of money laundering. And But that case is still sub decay. I don't want to go into detail with it, Chairperson. Yes. Thank you. Just still on that subject, um judge, I, I can't recall properly, but my question there is, what do you want us as the um, panel to make of that in light of the fact that you, one says one shouldn't be persuaded by, you know, what is there in the media, and I mean, I'm, I'm assuming at this point that, I mean, that those reports about that judge or magistrates are not necessarily verified. You must recall that the IPED a, a body represented by their, their, their head had come to the office. And that decision to remove the case from KZN was made at that particular time. It was not made necessarily at that time when the, the, this was the, the judge's comment came after the decision was made by Govan J. So the decision was already made at a time when I engaged with the, with the members of IPED. Thank you. And, and so just go back to the narrative thing. Would you, would you consider... Uh, when, you, when you're looking at um, what protects prosecutorial independence, um, would you say that a, they, they can be a public narrative that can end up becoming a danger to <clears throat> that prosecutorial independence? Yes. 
The second question is linked to what um, Ms. Filagazi asked you earlier on, which, which links to what uh, Advocate Morocco asked you earlier on relating to the, the nature of the complaints that were raised in respect of prosecutors in KZN. Were the, were the, were the, were the nature of complaints such that they required the NPA to conduct the kind of investigation referred to by Advocate Morocco? Or they were such that you could deal with them uh, by simply removing a prosecutor and, and as, as in a recusal application for a judge? I think perhaps the, the right word, uh, uh, Advocate Morocco, that I should raise is the concerns that were raised by the, by the, by the, by the IPAD police. That's why I said I never intended to cast any aspersions against my prosecutors. I love my prosecutors very much. The only issue that I was concerned about was the fact that let us do anything to ensure that whatever concerns are raised, at least we are able to say we have attended to the case, which was something with that had to be attended to. Honorable Chair, those are the questions I need to ask. Thank you. I was looking at the amicus. Maybe he wants he wants to say something. I'll finish speaking for today. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Chiba. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. Um, I hope we didn't keep you. I could see that you were not comfortable most of the time. <laughs> I hope uh, in the afternoon. Eh? Yeah. I hope we, we gave you enough breaks. Yeah. But thank you so much, and thanks to your legal assistance. Yeah. Thanks, Chairperson. Thank you. Housekeeping. Um, we we have two third party submissions so we now this this is the end of the evidence of witnesses that's been led right and and on wednesday we will start wednesday and thursday with um submissions made by Kasak on wednesday then followed by one of the parties i'm not sure who's going first um advocate Arons, i understand is back or whether advocate rip is going first but they can work that out between themselves. Followed on by, I, I'm not sure how long that will take, but whoever then follows on, follows on next. Thursday morning, we would then start with submissions from uh, full, from freedom under the law. And then if we had started the other party the day before, to then just continue. That would mean we could, um, we could attempt to finish uh, earlier on Friday. And maybe I have said this to the parties, the approach which the evidence leaders have adopted is, despite the rising views now and again, we are not prosecutors. So our role and what we will do in submissions is effectively summarize legal submissions, summarize factual submissions that has been made and submit that to the panel. We are not going to be reaching conclusions or arguing a side. And we thought that we would make that very clear up front. We are there to assist the panel in any way, but we are not going to be adopting an, uh, an attitude. As and we <coughs> appreciate that. Yeah, you have been of immense assistance up to this point. We really do appreciate it. Can we, can we just... Yes, we, we, what would also help is if we do get the submissions of the evidence leaders well enough, well, well enough in time so that we were able to um, then argue uh, in line. We don't want to find ourselves in coalition course with them over the law, over the, over the factual summaries of, of evidence and all those things uh, because it wouldn't be in our, in, our, in our interest to have that kind of situation arising. So if th th it would help, but I mean, if they can't do it, they can't do it. We would want them to actually provide us with written submissions that summarize what it is that they 
we are presenting to you as evidence on which to <coughs> draw conclusions um, in accordance with the terms of reference. Let's hear from uh, Ms. Bauer. So if we had another 150 hours in a day in the last three weeks, then we would probably have very gladly accommodated Advocate Masuku. But we are in the position of where the evidence of Advocate Mkhwebi was led late last week, Advocate Jiba, finishing off today, on different subjects that's got to be put in. So what we've done is we've drafted draft submissions on subject matters and on topics rather than per witness because per witness spans various topics and then we thought we would do it like that. So we are sitting with wholly incomplete submissions which we will endeavour as best we can. You will recall that at the start of the hearing we had um, issued what we thought was a draft note on the law. We will do our utmost to finish that very quickly and distribute that in final format. Um, which is the draft legal framework. But on the factual stuff, I have great reservations that we will be able to, to, to do that before we present. I think uh, to say you will do the best you can is reasonable enough. You can communicate with each other and see to what extent you can accommodate each other. You will do the best they can, they say. Just communicate with each other. <laughs> because as she says, you know, if we had another 120 hours in the day, um, she might, she says, provide you with a perfect draft. But uh, talk to each other and see to what extent you can come. If you're grossly yeah. unhappy, they can come to you. <laughs> can we then adjourn? Until, do we start at 10? 10, Wednesday. I'll pop an email, but I might have said to them 9.30. I think because we're reaching, you know, we're going towards the end of uh, these proceedings, we might want to maximize the time uh, of our lives. We're still alive after all these grueling uh, processes. We might want to start at 9.30 and maximize the time that we have. Can you start at 9.30 on Wednesday? Can we do that? Thank you very much for your cooperation. 9.30 Wednesday.